Hello and welcome to the American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast. I am your host, Titus, and today I am joined again by my friend Telly Davidson, film critic, culture critic, author of Culture Wars, a very good book on the 90s on which we will be doing a podcast soon. And we will be continuing, meanwhile, our conversation on Citizen Kane. In our first segment last week, we talked about Kane, the all-American hero. A man who comes out of nothing through money, who tries to become a progressive hero, who tries to break down the establishment and democratize power, but at the same time wants himself to be on top of America. He is not simply satisfied with being part of the aristocracy, he wants to be king of America, as it were. And so now, for our second part, we'll be talking about Kane at the top and Kane at the bottom, his downfall. The movie has this beautiful arc that is Orson Welles' attempt to reproduce what you would get in Shakespearean tragedy. In America, nobody gets a tragedy because nobody's that important. The country is more important than anybody. And then the tragedy becomes wanting to be the most important thing in America, to identify with America, to tell Americans what to believe, what to say, how to feel about things, what to do, and to have them live out your fantasy. And we try to explain that this is very much tied up with our technologies of political communications. Kane is a creature of the radio. He's the first man to realize how you could use the radio to nationalize the news, the political consciousness, to reach into everybody's private home, whether he is rich or poor, and in a sort of way bring them all together in their attention on you, kind of control their minds or something close to that. That's what our man Kane realizes. This is what he brings to the news. He's not just a playboy. He's not just a wannabe aristocrat taking trips to Europe and collecting art. He's also a man, if not of the people, then a man who believes in the people and wants to rule the people by telling them what to believe. And so, Telly, thanks for joining me again. And let's pick up our story here at The Inquirer, the great endeavor of Charles Foster King. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here and uh, I'm looking forward to it. So... When we move from the old business manager to the new business manager, from Thatcher to Bernstein, we see a massive shift in perspective. Thatcher never understood anything about why it is that Kane did everything that he did. Thatcher always helped him, always managed his business, always made sure he stayed profitable. And the story Thatcher tells starts with the childhood of Kane, all his riches and prep school, and goes through his newspaper years from the point of view of Thatcher, the old businessman, stodgy but solid. The problem with Kane is that he was a trust buster, progressive. He wanted all this TR fame, all this betraying his class in order to achieve the love of the public. And what did it give him? From Thatcher's point of view, the end of Kane is Black Tuesday. It's the big market crash of 29. Kane goes bankrupt and has to sign things over to Thatcher. Business has won. All the glory of Cain, all those effervescent years of massive political fights conducted in the newspapers that then affect the real world of politics and business, all of that led to what? He rose, but then he fell. That is the moral story that Thatcher puts in his own memoirs. That is what he wants to teach. But it turns out that's not the whole truth about Kane. And so we move to the new business manager, who's not a somebody, he's a nobody. He would have been a nobody but for Kane. Thatcher, to some extent, can say he created Kane, although he has to admit the creation escaped his control. Bernstein, instead, is a creature of Kane. He's just a guy who was there at the paper, who didn't show much promise, who had never been shown any respect, much less given influence and power in America. But he rose with the rise of Kane. And so he tells a very different story, and it's the one story that ends on a high note. He starts with a newspaper and ends with Kane at the top when he's the most influential newspaper man in America, at the time when America is the most important country in the world. Yes, and I think with regard to Thatcher, a lot of it was he couldn't really grok, he couldn't really understand Kane other than as a would-be delinquent of the rich. He couldn't understand why Kane had this yawning need for public acceptance, because Thatcher really, and people in his class of life, couldn't really give a flying Fig Newton about what the public thought of them. They only cared about what their fellow ruling class aristocrats thought of them. And I think that it was rather like, a, you know, he was a problem child. 
you know, why do you still care what the common folk think when your responsibility isn't to them? I remember reading a magazine biography of John Kerry back in 2004 when he was running for president. Whatever you think of Kerry's politics, they said that even though he was a Forbes, he came from one of the most ruling class of ruling class families. When he was in prep school and college, he was not Mr. Popularity because he wanted to prove himself. You know, the old commercial, never let him see you sweat. Well, he let people see him sweat. He let people see him push himself and apply himself. And when you're in that level of life, that's something that a Richard Nixon or a Lyndon Johnson, who was a shopkeeper's son, trying to work their way into the ruling class does. When you're born to it, you have people for that. You don't have to prove yourself. You are already proven. And I'm sure Thatcher thought that it was almost like the hand of fate or God that Cain would be smited by the stock market crash, which, as you say, I'm sure someone like Thatcher would have thought was in no small part brought on by crusading journalism, delving into matters that did not concern them. And as far as Bernstein goes, it was no accident that he was given a Jewish last name and was played as Jewish by the script co-written by Herman Mankiewicz because Bernstein was in many ways a satire of the anti-Semitic stereotype of, you know, the Jew that's good with money, but also of the Jewish studio and motion picture and radio slash television mogul who was taking all of their cues from why society. You know, the Louis B. Mayer who made movies about State Fair and Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland and John Wayne Westerns and that type of thing. Bernstein was very much of a knowing satire on that. I may be wrong, but I don't remember Bernstein ever having any kind of family relationship like a wife or kids. Yeah, it's not part of the movie. You're right. There was certainly, again, a hero worship of Cain there. So Mankiewicz and Wells, of course, were being very subtle in using Thatcher was the perfect satire of the entitled. I mean, he was the epitome of straight white male privilege. And Bernstein was the satire of the ethnic person who was trying to assimilate, hitching his wagon to what to him would have been a rich, old money, respectable person. Yeah, that's person. very well put. They are very different kinds of people, even though they end up at the top of business America, both of them. And that does show a shift in America, democratization. People like Thatcher think they are right and they have rights and privileges because they made American prosperity. They are stewards of the nation at the moment when it achieves world dominance. They are the people who made sure that America would be so rich and tried to make America stable even as it was democratizing because they thought stability counts far more than the kinds of achievements and the kind of democracy that would allow everybody to rise, including the Jews. You are right, of course, that Bernstein in the movie. He is a very different kind of guy. He is, even at the top of the business world, a kind of funny man of the people. He jokes around, I'm chairman of the board, I've got loads of time, I've got nothing but time, I don't do much. His leisure is not for the leisurely activities of wasps, who cultivated all these sorts of things that made for a kind of moral education. The country clubs, which often excluded Jews, of course, and Jews who made rich, created their own country clubs since they were being discriminated against because at the same time they did, as you say, want to assimilate. They did want to be part of respectability. They wanted to be accepted on the terms of the aristocracy. They wanted to come into it, but not to transform it too much. And Bernstein was also an infinitely, as you say, much more likable and decent person than Thatcher was. Thatcher was an analogy of Calvin Coolidge. The business of America is business. You know, what's good for General Motors and General Electric is good for America. That kind of a thinking. Whereas Bernstein... He certainly enjoyed having limitless funds and having influence, but because he wasn't born to it, he didn't take it too seriously. He had the self-awareness and the native intelligence as opposed to the classical intelligence that Thatcher had. 
to be self-aware. And he did not automatically look down on people as less than the way Thatcher did. Calvin Coolidge was a deeply moral guy. He was very respectable and there's no sense that he ever treated people badly. The old aristocracy of America was not all that corrupt. The wasps, for all their bigotry, are also the people who created, say, the SATs, which led to the rise of all the native intelligence, including, of course, Jews, in the case of Bernstein in the movie. So these people were not monsters by any stretch of the imagination. They were decent people, but they were an aristocracy, and America is a democracy, and so they were eventually gotten rid of. They were eclipsed, and the rise of this new kind of character is indeed more democratic. That's in many ways good, since it allows for more people to rise, and in certain ways it is more concerned with the people as such. But it is not unqualifiedly good, since it does encourage people to go crazy. When you prize energy more than stability, Kane more than Thatcher, you also set the stage for many ups and downs that could make people go crazy. Yeah. But it shows a shift of generation, of business, and of democracy. Bernstein is part of the media empire of Kane, and you are shown, for all the hero worship, that this is not necessarily that smart. And certainly it means you will think of justice in a new way. Justice for poor people, and in a way justice for American greatness. We start with Kane starting like Pulitzer and Hearst are said to have done in reality, the Spanish-American War. The conquest of Cuba, and you're told, wasn't it great that we won the Panama Canal? That's an achievement, but there was no justice to it. You're told explicitly that the war was fully manufactured for no good goddamn reason. Kane did it because he wanted his paper to be great. He wanted to tell the people what to believe and to create events, if the events weren't there for him merely to report on. And so that is a dangerous thing. The arrival of muckracking journalism, of yellow journalism, it may have done a lot of good on the progressive front for poorer people. Enact new legislation, new regulation to tame the market, as people would say. To put some limits to oligarchy in order to make the Democrats, the great majority of the people, especially the urban workers, make them a bit better off or at least give them some more security in life. These are all, of course, noble aspirations and in many ways they achieved practically good things. But it also creates foreign catastrophes, or at any rate encourages the country to a form of greatness that's somewhat dangerous. The age of progress was also the age of American imperialism, when you ended up, you know, running the Philippines for some reason. Very much so. If you were to say in between Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt who the two most progressive presidents were, without question they would have been Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. And both of them were absolute believers in white man's burden, in imperialism, that the United States, Canada, and Great Britain, and maybe France were at the top of the pyramid, and that they had an absolute, almost divine right to tell the rest of the world how to behave and to civilize them, particularly Roosevelt, Teddy, saw war almost as an athletic competition, the way we would see a contact sport like boxing or hockey or football. And Kane was, again, being used to satire of that and certainly of her own penchant for being the handmaiden to this progressivism as imperialism. And also of a more recent example, Henry Luce, who was at the height of his power with Time magazine at that time with the American century. I think Luce was in World War I, and he certainly was one of the loudest advocates for World War II and for the Cold War based on... On, he was the child, I believe, of missionaries on his missionary zeal to remake the rest of the world in America and Britain and the free democratic world's image. Yeah, so scientific, progressive enlightenment, trying to save the people from the miseries of capitalism and to improve living conditions. For all its good things, it also has a very dark side, including an entirely new scientific kind of racism. Progressives were also these kinds of weirdo racists, and we owe them eugenics, for example. Their title to power was also tyrannic. Their desire to help the people was also a desire to rule the people, to control people's thoughts, which the oligarchs never wanted to do before that. 
people embodied by Thatcher or President Coolidge, they were very much willing to say not just that business is what America does, but that Americans can live their own lives. They don't need to be told how to live them by somebody who controls their minds. Whereas Kane introduces these new principles of radio. Now, because of telegraph and radio, newspapers are national. This one guy through his conglomerates can make the news. The headline makes the news, he says. The old scribblers That's that he true. inherits at the Inquirer are losers financially because their ambitions are not great. They are respectable, imitations of the respectable aristocrats. If there's a big issue in the news, talk about it. But if there's especially ugly prurian things like shocker murders, which Americans have loved, loved, loved for a long time, don't cover that because it's immoral. Well, King changes that. He says the headline makes the news. Give me three big inches, that's what we will be doing from now on. And he forces these people who think they're respectable and they should cover public things to start covering private things like going into the slums and finding out about this woman's murder. Some of that is terrible, but some of it is good since crime mostly affects the poor. It's easier to believe in equality in the sense of equality before the law if you're rich and things are fine. If you're poor and you're a victim of crime disproportionately, then where's your equality before the law? So again, you see the point of the progressives. They had noble intentions and their burning anger against the injustice and oligarchy was not always wrong. It did quite a number of good things. So from the point of view of Bernstein, you have these two big actions of Cain that are supposed to reveal not him only at his worst with the Spanish War and things like that, but also him in a better light. We see Cain worrying about tomorrow's front page throughout the night again and again and again rewriting things up until he comes to what he wants, which is a declaration of his principles, which his friend Leland compares with the Declaration of Independence. It is independence for Cain, of course, but it is independence for America as well, in a sense. What Cain promises is that he will serve Americans the news honestly and entertainingly. Now, that is not exactly true since he wants to make the news, not simply report it. But it does show what a deep desire he had to connect with the people directly, to earn their trust in order to change their minds, to concern himself with their concerns rather than the concerns of the rich. It's slums, it's trust busting, it's the corruption of machine politics in the big cities, it is fighting against the injustices of cartels and oligarchies in public transportation and in any number of other cases. That part is the nobility of Cain or his aspiration to do justice for the people, to be trustworthy since he is close to them, as opposed to the previous ruling class which was as far away from the people as possible. The older people come from the 1880s when presidents didn't even campaign. It was still held to be noble and respectable to deny any ambition and to wait for the nomination to come to you on your front porch. You wouldn't be going out campaigning. Kane is a different kind of guy. He's part of the age of Roosevelt. FDR was the guy who invented the modern crusading campaign. You go to the nominating convention. You give this big speech where you tell people what the campaign is about. It's not just a contest between parties or a contest between two different candidates. It is also a contest of principles, a contest of agendas. The president becomes the aggressive, active agent of the people against the oligarchy. After Woodrow Wilson, FDR is the inventor of the modern State of the Union address, where a president in his popular majesty speaks down to the Congress and forces them to do his bidding because the people will not brook no for an answer. Action for the people is necessary. It's not about institutional stability. It's about presidential energy to transform things for the sake of the people. And even more than that, the FDR had his famous fireside chats where he would directly use the radio to communicate. And Eleanor wrote newspaper columns to communicate directly and unfilteredly with the people and with the public as well. And you were seeing that with the royal family making radio addresses and so forth when the war was going on a few years later, which were really Shocking isn't the right word, but they were really important removals of the boundary and the barrier between the president, the king and queen and their people in the modern media age. And also, as you say, I mean, certainly William Randolph Hearst, for all of his progressivism, that 
this illustrates the dichotomy of progressivism in the late 1800s and early 1900s. William Randolph Hearst ran some of the most appallingly racist things, particularly against Asians, although he was certainly no friend to black people or to Spanish-speaking people or to Native Indians. Years before Japan attacked Pearl Harbor or before communist China, he was talking about the yellow peril and the sneaking Asians and so forth in his papers. And Woodrow Wilson was an avowed white supremacist who showed premier screening of Birth of a Nation, I believe, in the White House and was sympathetic to the Ku Klux Klan. And so here you have these two crusading progressives who did so much to amplify the concerns of the poor, but who also had monstrous views when it came to race. And that irony, Citizen Kane didn't really unpack it because you really couldn't have in a movie of that time, but it came as close as they could to showing the sort of two-faced side of 1900s, 1910s, 1920s progressivism in that way. Yeah, that's true. And now that we have moved from the first part, which is Kane the public person, to the second part, Kane the private man, all of the ugliness begins to seep through. You're right that there are certain things you can't talk about, like racism at the time. This was not part of the national conversation, and it was in certain ways not possible because of the progressives and their own faults. And so you see the double-sided picture of the democratic crusader. On the one hand, we are Democrats, and so we hate oligarchic restraints on the people, and we want more justice. We rebel against the institutions. But on the other side, we want to become the institutions, we want to take control of the institutions and therefore be the people up top and implement our ideas, some of which are crazy. You're right that Woodrow Wilson was especially a rabid racist, but he did it on a new scientific basis. Corresponding to D.W. Griffiths being shown in the White House, the racist uh, masterpiece, one of the first great American movies, Birth of a Nation, which invented the American movie more or less. So also you had FDR in Orson Welles' time showing Gabriel over the White House at the White House, which appalled Churchill, for example, because it's a movie that openly says that a kind of dictatorship which we would now call fascism plus propaganda should be the ruling religion in America and the ruling politics, you know, for the sake of the people, of course. But don't let them have a say in it. The way Bernstein ends his account of Cain is with Cain's big party. This great showmanship put on by Orson Welles, this big extravaganza, the showgirls, the cabaret, alcohol for everybody, ice sculptures, and all the backslapping and congratulations that the Inquirer is now the biggest thing in the nation. How did Kane become such a big newspaper man? Well, he simply bought out the competition, stole all their journalists for bigger pay. That's what counts. They served one policy before, they'll serve another one now because they're just hacks at the job. They're the best in the nation at popularity, at getting the people to listen, but they don't serve any particular principle. The old oligarchs had their principles, the new progressives have their principles, but tyrannic men like Cain don't really. They just want to be loved by America. And hacks who serve them also, they don't. Like the people who worked for Hearst or Pulitzer, they did whatever they were told. They had no principles. Success in business often is quite unprincipled, and behind all the lofty rhetoric is just private advantage. This is where Bernstein leaves off the story. I think that the party scene was one of the best and most skillful uses of montage in a film at that point. You've got Charles Foster Kane with a bunch of chorus girls, and all the men at his paper applauding him and egging him on as he's part of a show, a part of a song and dance. And they have this song for Charles Foster Kane. Who is this man, this famous man? They have this entire number. Kane, of course, has a knowing contempt for popularity. He says, in this town, you know, you give somebody five cents, they'll write a song about you. That's what it's like. But at the same time, he clearly enjoys himself. He wants to be the center of attention. And you have a microcosm of America, the popularity of the chorus girl the influence given to you by these representatives of the people, the journalists, everybody applauding him, everybody in love with Charles Foster and Kane. Surely this is the portent of greatness. And here we switch narrator from Bernstein to Leland, who knew him most personally. And Leland talks about Charles Foster Kane's marriages. 
it's not just this public coup, this great buying off of the competition that puts him in the top rank of American journalism all of a sudden. It's also his new fame. He goes for a vacation now that he's successful and in Europe he meets the niece of the president and on a whirlwind romance there's marriage at the White House, there's all this celebrity stuff that shows Kane has made it as an aristocrat. The most respectable Americans, the most waspy of the wasps, welcome him among them. He marries one of their daughters. That's how oligarchy is supposed to work. How do you deal with ambitions? Well, you need new blood and you don't want enemies, so you marry your daughters to rising ambitions. And that's what Charles Foster Kane does. And so the journalist who is the stand-in for the audience, mostly we see his back because we're looking at the movie like he is looking at the people he's talking to. This guy Thompson asks, did he really love his first wife? What was that like? And that's often the case when you have the multiple marriage. You have the starter wife, as they say, who is married either out of early love or a desire for respectability. And then you have the second one, which is the more self-indulgent. But it also shows when you're talking about the party and the chorus girls and the campaign song and that type of thing. It also just shows what a born showman he was. There was a part of him that might just as well have graduated from Barnum and Bailey or the Keith Orphean circuit or Ringling Brothers because he had that natural flair for show that he couldn't resist. This was certainly showing Kane, and all biopics have this in biographies in real life, the moment when the person either has it all or thinks they have it all. And this was him at his glory years. He had entree into legitimate society. He had his newspaper empire and his political empire that he was building. And he had his showmanship. He was having his cake and eating it too. But you sort of knew at that time as it transitioned to Leland's perspective that it wasn't going to stay that way forever. Leland was, as befitting a newspaper man, whether upper class or lower class, was sort of the most cynical and helpfully so of the narrators. Susan Alexander later on would be blatantly and vulgarly cynical, but Leland was the most healthy, skeptically cynical as someone who really had an understanding of human nature in a way that Bernstein and Thatcher never did, and of psychology. He was fascinated watching Kane walking the tightrope of having everything he wanted all at once. But you could tell that he knew that sooner or later the tightrope would slip. Yeah, what makes him such a good observer is that he is very much aware of Kane's nobility, of his great striving, of the virtues and efforts and tireless activity that got him to the top. But he's also aware of something that Americans are insufficiently aware of, and it befits a decayed aristocrat like Leland, what a you know waspy English name there. It befits him to notice this because mostly we believe failure is the tragedy, whereas he realizes that success is the tragedy. What destroys you is not that you weren't rich or successful enough. Usually what destroys men of some ambition or greatness is that they got everything they wanted, only it turned out not to be what they wanted. Or it turned out to be insufficient to what they wanted. And when you look at someone, whether it's Donald Trump or Bill and Hillary Clinton or Sanders or Jeremy Corbyn, one wonders if they're ever really happy. They are so yawningly, insatiably needy for either public acclaim or for the cause to be the transformer, to be the pseudo-messiah. When you have someone that insatiably needy, you sort of know that they go almost like a drug addict or an alcoholic from high to high when they're on television, when they're making speeches, when they're writing books or something. At that moment, they're enjoying themselves because they thrive on chaos and hecticness and, as you say, energy. But when they're not getting that constant dopamine, almost sexual stimulation, then one wonders what's going on in the movie Election. Reese Witherspoon played the, you know, hyper-ambitious young woman. And whenever she had alone time, 
when she wasn't doing or planning or plotting or scheming or what have you, she heard this sort of screaming, yeah, 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 white noise. And I think Charles Foster probably heard that too. And Leland knew he heard that. When he wasn't getting high on sex parties, public acclaim, toadying and such, there wasn't a there there. Truman Capote, of course, said it in the title to his last book, there are more tears shed over answered prayers than unanswered ones. And Cain was certainly exhibit A for that. Yeah, so Leland completes a picture with pieces we had been missing before. His insight is that there's always going to be a fundamental conflict between love and friendship. Erotic love is something you can, through politics and through technology, make universal. You could want to be the conqueror of the earth like Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great, or Napoleon for that matter. You could want through technology everybody to know you and maybe to be famous forever. But friendship isn't of that character. Friendship is necessarily among a few people. People who really know you, that is, who can love you for who you are, if you are lovable, if you strive to be lovable to earn their love, that's only for a few people. Even in our crazy social media days, like you can have all the friends in the world on Facebook, everybody knows that's not real. People may be desperate chasing after it, but it's not real. The love of friendship is necessarily exclusive. Only a few people, usually you start to know them young, like Leland and Kane met when they were kids, suffering the same sufferings and angry at the same authorities. Those people might last you for a lifetime. Everything else is necessarily far more transient because love in the erotic sense is just far more tyrannic and far more fickle. And this is Leland's insight that Charles Foster Kane wanted above all to be loved. He was a tyrant because of love. We usually say that a tyrant is somebody who is racist, somebody who does injustice against poor people. That's the tyrant. But that's not true. The only true tyrant is the man who is fully erotic, who is run by his desires and above all the desire to be loved by everybody and therefore to have everything in the whole world if possible forever. It's that madness that makes you want to be a god. This is what our celebrities play acted for us. These people were on top of the world, satisfying every desire, the rules of justice or society or nature didn't seem to apply to them. They could be super talented, super satisfying, they could indulge every desire, get high on drugs, alcohol, whatever, treat people like dirt, kill people, they could get away with everything. At least for a while they were gods, not mere human beings. And the fact that they become so popular shows you that at some level they indulge the popular desire. Those of us who don't have a lot of money, don't have a lot of attention, don't have all these privileges, wonder what would it be like? Why not somebody like me, if not me myself, have all that and let's see what happens? Couldn't you achieve great things then? Whereas Leland sees that there is something very dangerous in this. If there's no limits to your desires, if you can never take no for an answer, if you'd rather die than stop, then in a sense you have lost your humanity. The freedom you achieve by fighting off oligarchs who put limits on your actions might lead you to a worse slavery than to, you know, an institution. It might mean slavery to your desires and you end up as a drug addict dead. Leland has pity for his great friend, but he also fears the dangers to which he's vulnerable. Leland sees that if you want to love the people, the people will corrupt you and turn you into a monster. Not because the people are all that evil, but because they are very needy and they respond to a great man. And the great man has no inherent limits. He doesn't know when to say no, when to shut up, when to go away, when to stop. And that means that he wants to be everything for everybody. At least in the age of radio, as Roosevelt proved, you could use this new technology to control people's lives to a vast extent. Up to their private lives and their homes, what they would hear, what they would believe. You could be that for everybody. As soon as Kane gets his presidential wife, the niece of the president, and all the social cachet and political ambitions that shows, he wants to be the next president in truth. He wants to have it all. As soon as he gets all that, he stops going home to his wife. He's always in love with the paper. And his wife in a mocking moment says that she would rather have a rival in the flesh. You know, can't he just have a mistress or have that kind of temptation that men with power might indulge? 
Why does it have to be the paper? There's no competing with the nation. A woman cannot hope to have the same charms as American greatness itself has. So this marriage is wrecked on the fact that the wife he sort of adored because she was perfectly polished was just not enough because she had none of the charms of popularity that seduced him the most. In a way, it was the fact that she was access to presidential stuff that he loved. A reception party for your wedding at the White House. Isn't that great? But then you have to go home and actually live a private life so that you have some limits on your madness. But nobody ever tells Charles Foster Kane no. And so we see how in his first marriage he goes from self-deprecating humor to outright hostility and contempt for the wife's desire to actually have him home. The more and more he lives in this fantasy land of newspapers and radio where he is the voice of America. He speaks for the people, he speaks for their rights, and gradually the madness leads him to political ambitions. And Leland has to see this, that what they shared, hatred of oligarchy, love of progress, love of the people, achieve the reforms that would make America a more just country, destroy Kane. He hates machine politics so much that he runs for governor on the progressive ticket in New York against a really corrupt guy, but that corrupt guy was actually pretty normal, or he was for normalcy. Whereas Kane has no limits, and indeed is not satisfied to threaten the guy with breaking up his political operation, with winning the governorship and changing politics, he continuously threatens to throw that guy in jail, as of course our politicians do to each other today again. Another thing that makes Cain both prescient and typical, relevant, we understand that this is part of our politics. Great hatreds and angers that lead people to office can turn to lock her up, send Trump to prison, these sorts of passions that rile the people, that speak to popular anger, but also speak to the frustrated ambitions of the great. What's the point of crawling to the top if you can't throw your enemies in jail? Since you can't have that much satisfaction in your satisfactions, you could get darker, crueler, angrier satisfactions by destroying your enemies. Cain reveals the ugly side of progress by revealing how much violent anger comes out of frustrated desires. If you're not satisfied with loving friends and a loving wife, then nothing human will satisfy you. You will turn into a monster. Yes, and Cain's first wife was an important character, but she was not one of the people used really as an audience surrogate. We sort of felt sorry for her, but she didn't have the same role to play in the narrative that Bernstein and Thatcher and Leland, or later on Susan, his second wife, did. And so all of the people who we've seen Cain up to this point through the eyes of have been men. And the difference between male friendship and female friendship or gay male friendship is the Iron John thing. You are not allowed to show weakness. It's not transactional. It's not, well, I'll be your friend as long as you do this for me and that for me and that for me and that type of thing. Guy friends are friends as sort of fellow travelers, compatriots. You know, they play on the same sports teams, they jam in the same bands, they work in the same job, they live next door to each other, and they care about each other. But it isn't the kind of friendship in most cases where you can really have a dependency on the other person. And that's something that Leland definitely saw. He was, I think, fascinated, but a little bit repulsed by the transactionality of Cain's friendships and even his romantic relationships. Also, it was certainly no accident that Cain finally, after having no one who really stood up to him and was in a position to bring him down, that his nemesis was Boss Geddes, played so wonderfully by Ray Collins, who was a member of the Mercury Theater, but who had done things on stage. He was probably in his late 40s at the time. And he, of course, went on to be Lieutenant Trag on Perry Mason and would do many other movies and stage things in between. To have this canny, foxy, machine politician bring the great and powerful Charles Foster Kane to heel, finally, was a turning point for him. And it was also when the young joie de vivre, happy-go-lucky Kane died and the grim, resentful, bitter Charles Foster Kane took over. 
and you noticed how he's, I hate to use the word educated because it's anything but education, but how Charles Foster Kane, when he was 20 years old, had self-awareness and had a sense of humor about himself. And Charles Foster Kane, when he was 60, had absolutely zero self-awareness or sense of humor or irony about himself. And it was at that point when he was defeated that he educated himself out of having a sense of self-awareness. And that's certainly something that you see comparing Trump today having his tantrums on Twitter to what Trump was like in the 80s in his youthful heyday. That's certainly a parallel. You wonder how they can say them and not be aware of the hypocrisy and the contradiction in so much of what so many of our political and business leaders say publicly. Some of them never had any self-knowledge to begin with, but what's really scary is some of them did, and some of them were very well-educated and insightful, and they almost consciously, you know, all the psychologists talk about someone who kills their inner child. They kill their self-awareness in order to be able to live as they do. Yeah, self-knowledge is hard to come by. One reason we worship youth and beauty is that we don't have a world full of old people who are happy and content. Self-knowledge is not for sissies. Charles Foster King thinks he will know exactly who he is when everybody will know who he is. As soon as he is on top of the world and he becomes everybody's wish fulfillment fantasy, then he will know exactly who he is. What's inside of him and what's outside of him will be identical. The world will be exactly who he is. And that's what all ambitious people want. Leland is the only guy who tries to stop this because he hopes to retain his friend, to stay at this level where they're not equals but comparable, where Charles Foster Kane, the greater man, nevertheless knows that he needs his noble friend and he needs to be put in his place now and then. One of the things that at levels high or low male friendship does is what we call ball busting. People will remind you in a friendly but firm way that you're not in the center of the universe, you're not on top of the world. But if what you want truly is to be on top of the world, then you're never going to have friends. Because their competition will annoy or frustrate your desires. Leland points out that he never really loved his first wife that much, because it started out with love, but there was not a lot of that in Cain. He wasn't going to settle for a private life. It was never going to be good enough for him, and so the only solution would have been to stick to a friendship with Leland and men like that, because they could talk together, think together, act together on the grand scale of America and world history, but without going fully insane in loneliness. But of course, Cain is just too erotic to allow for that. There can be no frustration of his desires. Nobody can say no to him. But of course, everybody ends up saying no to him because he's not quite as powerful as he thinks he is. There's a difference between Citizen Cain and tragedy. When Oedipus is king of Thebes or Macbeth is king in Scotland, there's no gain saying them. If they go mad, the whole country suffers. Their fate affects everybody's fate. They have a tremendous power. Even Cain in America is just another guy. The country will move on. People's lives will not be destroyed. Millions will not be dying. It will just be a temper tantrum. And he was acutely aware of that deep down, which is what he was fighting against. If he could have waved a magic wand and made himself into Napoleon or what have you, he would have. And speaking of the erotic, the one female character that we really got a perspective and a POV on of Kane, of course, being Susan Alexander, that also was the perfect analogy for how he was both a rebel against the class system of his time and yet hopelessly trapped by it. For someone on the level of Charles Foster Kane to be involved with a vulgar vaudeville singer was unacceptable. Vulgar vaudeville singers and comics married actors and comedians and minor uh, aristocrats. They didn't marry the real thing. So he had to most unsuitably remake her into an opera diva because that was acceptable to the standards of high culture at the time. And that's where you see the stark difference between Cain's world and today. 
today you have people who were born to money, you know, the Paris Hiltons of the world, the Kim Kardashians of the world, and so forth, who aspire to act like reality and tabloid TV stars, and who in many ways become themselves reality and tabloid TV stars consciously and deliberately. They're taking their cues from celebrity culture. Whereas in Susan Alexander's day, you could have someone who was brought up dirt poor, like Joan Crawford was, but who aspired to playing ladies when she was on the stage and on the screen, trying to take cues from the aristocracy and royalty. And now it's vice versa. Now the aristocracy and royalty, such as it is, takes their cues from movies and television and from celebrity culture. Yeah, that is a big shift in mores, and it shows you that democracy is not perfect. It has many advantages in terms of justice, but it creates also a new kind of misery in private life. If you want to be influential or famous, you gotta be a celebrity and therefore debase yourself endlessly up until you end up a caricature. This self-debasement is seen in celebrity culture better than anywhere else, but of course, it changes many, many, many aspects of life. It is the case that poor people don't dress like rich people anymore or try to talk like them. It's rich people in elite enclaves who dress like and try to imitate poor people, which is a strange caricature. America now has billionaires who go around in jeans and t-shirts while they manipulate the nation as though that were true equality, that were true democracy. It's a show just like Charles Foster Kane put on a show. And it becomes dangerous when it is no longer recognizable. With old money or elites or aristocracies or oligarchs, you can tell they're not part of the people. And that creates a healthy distance and a healthy distinction. When rich people pretend that they are the people, and therefore they don't have any different situations, they don't have class responsibilities anymore. They don't have any more to be stoic, they don't have to dedicate themselves to public service, much less do they have to involve themselves endlessly in charity. Now they can just enjoy themselves like any of the people, but on the level of Greek gods rather than mere mortals, and it creates a whole social catastrophe. There is this danger in democracy that you already see embodied in Charles Foster Kane, and it shows that Orson Welles had, from his background in theater, quite an awareness of the tragic potential of Eros that wanting to be loved by the people, wanting everybody to know your name, is going to be a catastrophe. There it is, people can't help themselves, you want to be on top of the world. With the case of the second wife, Leland has this very contemptuous note, he says, remember Charles Foster Kane when he first met her? He told me she was a cross-section of the American public. Kane can't help himself from contempt, even for people he loves. Now, Kane's relationship to this uh, chorus girl who ends up his second wife is somewhat complicated because Kane is not simply a bad guy. He has some of the dignity of the tragic hero, and that in America means there is a root of every man in him. And the way this plays out completely destroys his political career. At the top of his fame, when he's for sure that he has won an election before the votes have been cast, as Leland says, he wants even the pollers and all the newspapers to love him, the people have to love him, but he presumes on their love. Before an election, he thinks he is already elected. And that shows a tremendous arrogance, which of course was exactly what Hillary Clinton was, or anybody like that. But even more so, it shows a certain irresponsibility. Kane is on the precipice of success when he realizes that it doesn't really amount to all that much. It wouldn't make him personally happy. And he cannot sacrifice his personal happiness to his public duty or to his reputation. What counts first with him is nobody ever gets to tell him no. And so he shacks up with this chorus girl, leaves his wife behind, and the movie shows that the wife who divorces him and their young son, Cain III, die in a car accident. Progress kills them. Instead, he is left alone. Just like he tried to remake the American public through progress, through a new kind of politics, he tries to remake this woman through high-class culture, to turn a chorus girl into an opera singer, making her miserable and ruining her life in the process. In the beginning, he kind of loved her natural vulgarity because it reminded him of his own childhood. He came from the low class. In his young years, he knew that Americans can be natural. You can just enjoy your private life and not be so obsessed about how the entire world sees you. In a moment of weakness, when he is literally at his dirtiest, 
a passing vehicle just splatters him one evening after a campaign event. He sees this girl and she makes fun of him and he learns to make fun of himself this one last time in the movie. Is his last moment of a sense of humor about himself and getting splashed with the dirt. Talk about a metaphor. Yep. His first wife, as is so often the case, the starter wife was his social equal, if not social superior. And the second, once he's established himself, is for fun. It's a trophy wife. Yes, exactly. Which she was well aware of being. Not thrilled about it, but not so unthrilled that she was willing to give up her financial and other privileges of it. Going back to William Randolph Hearst, there's strong evidence, as you know, that one of the reasons Hearst had such an enmity and a hatred for the film wasn't so much that it was an attack on him, but because, as you say, the Susan Alexander character was a clear analogy to Marion Davies, Hearst's longtime mistress, who was a star of stage and screen in her own right. I believe it was Mankiewicz said that it shocked him that Hearst reacted so violently against it because he said the reason we made her a not terribly talented chorus girl and singer was because Marion Davies was unambiguously very talented. And we thought if we made her classless, vulgar, tacky, people would know that the very dignified, witty Marion Davies was not being satirized here. But instead, what happened was it made people think of Marion Davies as being less than she actually was. But Hearst himself played into that because Davies was a very talented comedian in the sort of Lucille Ball, Carol Lombard mode. But he thought comedy was for unfeminine, butch, vulgar women. And he wanted her to star in turgid, soap operatic prestige productions, which was the parallel between the two characters beyond the obvious where Mankiewicz might have been a little bit captious, where he went a little too far was Marion Davies was, I believe, a jigsaw puzzle static. And the movie made no bones about that being Susan Alexander's favorite way to pass the time as well. And also another rumor, Rosebud was Hearst's pet name for his favorite part of Miss Davies' anatomy. And that that was something Mankiewicz was aware of because he was a former friend of Miss Davies. So he may have doth protested a little too much how shocked he was that anyone would have drawn the conclusion that Susan Alexander was a metaphor for it. He could have toned it down a lot more if he really wanted them to not think that. But in any case, the parallel was there of someone in love with someone in a sexy, erotic show business world, but who also had enough of his social class to want to keep up appearances. Yeah, I hadn't heard that story before, but it's a hilarious rumor. And it makes a certain important point. The reason Hearst was so hateful is because he didn't accept comedy, which indeed he didn't like in her own career. And that is the common opinion of mankind. Comedy is not respectable. You can just look at the Oscars. If you're writing comedy, like Billy Wilder in classic Hollywood or Woody Allen now, you're gonna get dozens literally of Oscar nominations. If you act in a comedy, like say Cary Grant, you're never even gonna see an Oscar nomination, or Eddie Murphy in our times. People laugh at comedy and therefore they laugh at comedians. And people who aren't comfortable with that are not going to be happy in the business. If you want to be a celebrity more than you want to tell the comic truth, it's going to destroy you that people will never love you as much as they love some teenager in a soap opera or in a kind of tragedy. There's nothing Eddie Murphy could have done to be as famous as Leonardo DiCaprio because DiCaprio was Romeo, every teenage girl's fantasy. Tragedy is more attractive than comedy when it comes to making idols. Comedy destroys idols, and part of the attempt of Citizen Kane is to show that Kane is laughable, not just tragic. That there was a lot to him that was stupid, silly. It's not just that he was a boaster, that he thought he was greater than he actually was, although he was really great. 
but that he went to insane lengths to play out his fantasies of class, of social approval, and he could never live well enough alone. He could never accept the natural vulgar part of him as his birthright, really. It's where he was born and he was brought up for his first years, and it wasn't a terrible thing. It may not be as good as being an aristocrat, but it's not so bad. People can live fairly reasonable lives and they become much better than the aristocrats if they don't go insane and do all the mad stuff that Cain does. That's true enough, and it also shows the Hall of Mirrors aspect to this movie. This was a movie about a man who destroyed norms and institutions because he himself was afraid of the day that he would be destroyed by the Grim Reaper. He couldn't bear the fact that other people might destroy his legend. He was the one exception to his own rule. Yeah, that's a very good point. And uh, as you pointed out earlier, both Cain and Hurst have this mad, mad desire to be there forever because they hear the howl of mortality, the yawn of the abyss closing in on them, and they can't deal with that. Above all, they cannot deal with mortality. What makes people who are hyper-erotic hyper-erotic is that they wish for immortality, perfection, completeness. They want to be Greek gods. And if you believe in that too much, it turns you into a tragic hero. We all want more than we have, but we don't all simply go beyond the limits of nature. Whereas that's what Eros promises. You can be in love with the greatest things and then become one with the greatest things and you'll be perfect forever. And that way madness lies, not accepting any limits, not even mortality, wishing for something that is naturally impossible. And that reveals some of the problems with progress. It's not enough for progressives to want for more justice and to fight against bad things. They want perfection pure and simple and it drives them insane and it makes some of their politics insane as well. And as Leland pointed out, Cain should have been way more worried about the people than he was because they're not just gonna take what he gives them as progress and justice, they're gonna want to organize for themselves in these very vulgar labor unions and then all his money and wealth will itself be threatened. He thought he could change the old way of things and still keep the old way of things for him. But it doesn't work that way. Once you change the political regime in the direction of more democracy, more popular access to power, then they're going to create their own labor unions and organize for themselves because they're free Americans. They're not just puppets in the hands of a progressive politician. That was never something that Cain could deal with. And so as he fails in public, he fails in private. As he fails to transform the American people into what he wanted, he also fails to transform Susan Alexander, his second wife, into what he wanted. And he torments her with his insane ambitions for opera singing and ruins her life. And she stayed with him because she wanted to be loved by a great man. And she got what everybody wants, a Cinderella story, but that too, that popular fantasy, it ruins her, it makes her miserable, a drunkard in Atlantic City in a nightclub without a lot of patrons. It's a terrible thing to have happened to the woman, but, you know, she was attracted. She saw this great thing, and she couldn't say no. And that turns out to ruin her just as surely as it ruins Charles Foster Kane himself. Well, when you talk about that overlap, too, that's something we're dealing with now, and we have been for the last 20 or so years, and kind of uh, appropriately, because we're in the early years of this century, and in the early years of last century, was the realization that people couldn't have their cake and eat it, too. They couldn't have the past and the present at the same time forever. The big changes, of course, of the last century were the invention of the telephone, automobile, the assembly line, and the modern-day factory, electricity, indoor plumbing becoming commonplace, and so forth. And that brought an end to both the plantation gone with the wind and the sort of Marshall Dillon and Miss Kitty kind of agricultural frontier way of life and brought us into the industrial age and that horse and buggy coach builder didn't go out of business the day after Mercedes Benz made the first car, but the clock started ticking for them. And of course, the great tragedy outside of the geopolitical events, things like 9-11 and terrorism, 
the great policy tragedy with regard to the economy of the later Clinton years and the George W. Bush and the early Obama years is that we did nothing to deal with what happened when the overlap ended. People thought in 1999 and 2000 that we could indefinitely have Netflix and Blockbuster, Amazon and Borders and Barnes and Noble, Craigslist and eBay and thriving newspapers supported by classified ads. And when the rising technology reached critical mass, it almost inevitably put the old technology, the old way of life out of business. And again, Kane is an analogy to that. His happiest moment was when he had it all, when he had the prestige wife and child and the showmanship and the money and his good looks and health. But it couldn't last forever. One of the two was going to give. I remember my mother read to me The Wind in the Willows when I was very young. And of course, the signature line of Toad when he's dying. It is the end of everything, for it is the end of Toad. Thus it was with Charles Foster Kane when it was his time to face the music. Yeah, the more successful you are, the harder it is to reconcile yourself to mortality. What's the point of being on top of the world if it's not forever? What can justify your mortality when you're supposed to be fulfilling everybody's fantasies to be the perfect man? Trying to bring about the perfect society is not going to be enough because you still die. It's not going to be so good for you then. Cain has no family, even his second wife leaves him, his son is dead, the country has forgotten him, and you see this poetic emphasis on nothingness. You can see why Americans are less insane than Cain. Americans, unlike him, are Christians. You have to reconcile yourself to your death and hope in the afterlife, and you have to reconcile yourself to human injustice and hope for divine justice in the afterlife. You have to admit that you're gonna die, but if you have family that loves you, you'll leave some of yourself behind. It is easier and more reasonable to live that way than to try to be king of the universe and have it all blow up in your face later. But it's not so easy for people on top of the world. As you pointed out, we didn't deal with globalization well because the people who were winning thought it was going to last forever and they didn't care about the people who were suffering. The prestige, celebrity, authoritative speech industries went insane and didn't even look out for themselves as they were threatened by technological revolutions because they thought the old era of TV was going to last forever. But no, new technology turned it into celebrity for everybody and is going to wipe it all out. And the rich people of today are a bit less cocksure and are trying hard to move out of that way of making money because they realize that advertising money is not going to last even if Facebook and Google now have all the money all the newspapers and TV used to have. It's going to go through some kind of shock. But they too are completely unwilling to realize that their vast oligarchic powers are limited and the only way you can make them last is by making democracy a deal that is mutually just. As with Cain, so with Trump, a demagogue rises from media savvy to realize that the people are ripe for rebellion. That the people kind of hate their betters, their superior classes. And they realize that just being on top of the world doesn't mean that you're in charge of the world. The world might change on you without you realizing it. And you can see not just the old established influence and money in the media, but the young people who grew up in journalism and on the internet thinking that they would be the next great thing. They're all shocked and horrified that this Trump guy came along and wiped out all their fantasies. And they blame him as though if you get rid of Trump, that can turn back history. It's not going to work that way. Technological changes and social changes are going to create some kind of new form of American democracy and in many ways a much older form of democracy. You can't be a celebrity anymore. There's nothing Jim Acosta can do to become Dan Rather or Walter Cronkite because nobody would listen to him anyway. His antics are stupid, but there are no good options for him either. There's no wise newspaper man who has this paternal avuncular authority that Cronkite once did. It's not possible anymore because people don't have the discipline to sit down every evening and listen to you. They don't give a damn about you. So people are desperate, but they also misunderstand the character of the change. Trump realized that media is useful for one thing, to get the engine of American political change going again by mounting a populist attack on elites. 
is just that our progressives don't realize how vulnerable they are. Since we're progressives, we're for civil rights, we're against racism, we're for women, we're against sexism, how could anybody be against us? Only fascists could be against us. Well, actually, the people could be against you. The majority of the people might hate you for your privileges. They don't realize that, much like the rich people of the turn of the last century who made American wealth, didn't realize that once Americans get wealthier, they might get very angry at people on top of them, who have such privileges that may be earned in one generation, but by the time your riches put you on top of the world, they're not earned anymore. And it's time for change again. People always want change to bring them on top, but they don't want change then to bring them down. But it's happening to globalization and it's happening to the globalized elite that ended up with Mark Zuckerberg promising to change the world by making everybody all over the world friends. It would be globalized politics, but without the politics, just in private fantasies on Facebook.com. Well, that's not going to last. It's going to collapse sooner rather than later because the whole of society is changing to deal with the fact that globalization didn't help everybody and it created a new class of elites that the people now hate. The lead of my article on uh, Citizen Kane's 70th anniversary at the time was that one of the most subversive and shocking things the movie made subtly was that in the 1930s, the trend throughout the world was the strong man, especially in reaction to the Great Depression and in Russia and Germany's cases in reaction to World War I and the Bolshevik Revolution. Certainly Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini and Franco were overt military strongmen and dictators in the worst sense. But Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, even if you think that they were the most wonderful, best leaders we ever had and were responsible for saving the free world, they behaved in many ways as Lincoln did. At that point, they behaved more as dictators than they did as democratic leaders. Perhaps they had to. The shocks of World War I and of the Great Depression were such that people needed this sort of strongman mentality. But the great insight that Cain had was that if America was to ever fall to a strongman, it would come from the media as opposed to someone from the military with a whole bunch of you know medals hanging off of their chest like Castro or Pinochet later on. It would come from someone who was a media tastemaker and shaper, which is certainly an analogy for Trump in some sense, but also for the demagogues, the Huey Longs in their day, who were able to exploit the new medium of the radio. And also, as far as the technology goes, certainly when you think of someone like Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or Vinton Cerf, the NASA technologist who helped invent the Internet, a person can certainly make a case that they made as much, if not more, of an influence on society as Clinton or Bush or Obama or Trump as far as how they changed the day-to-day -day lives of the people and indeed the economy itself. In some ways, it prefigured the idea of the media mogul being as powerful and certainly longer running than an actual king or president. Yeah, so modern politics has lots of institutions built into it, and it is primarily institutional politics since it's about representative government and administration that's apparently continuously centralizing. But the problem with that is that the people aren't involved in institutions in Washington, D.C. They aren't involved in the stock exchange in New York. They aren't involved in the studio system in L.A. or any of these things. So what's going to connect the people to politics, to power, to where the big decisions are made, where the principles of justice that everybody believes in his own heart are expressed, articulated, debated, and you know decided upon in any particular crisis? Well, the media do that. In the times of the American founding, the newspapers counted for a great deal the ability to publish pamphlets and little books. Tom Paine's common sense was read throughout America, spread like wildfire. In the times of Lincoln, it was Telegraph that changed the newspapers and allowed the president to speak to the nation, allowed him to learn about what's going on and to have a vast influence beyond the little White House that looked medieval compared to nowadays, of course. 
and in the times of FDR, it was radio that did it, and now it's the dying days of TV, which is what Reagan used so well, but so also does Trump now, in a far crazier way, since the whole technology is going to hell. You need technologies of political communication to reach the people. That's, you know, built into the system. As the Federalist teaches us, you need representative government to refine and enlarge the public views. But you also need to reach the people, and that's what political parties and technology do. And political parties are weak in our times, and so it's on technology to do this. To let the people express at least approval and disapproval of whatever political ideas or policies are proposed. And it's also because politicians suck so bad. One reason we ended up with Trump is look at the Republican candidates of 2016 or the Democrat candidates of 2020. You have a bunch of non-entities and a bunch of wannabes who think that they too will become celebrities, but none of these people matter. And everybody can tell that politicians are super mediocre and therefore they are not at all equal to the task. They cannot understand what it is that scares people or what makes people really enthusiastic when that happens. That's why now and then some very media savvy guy will show up and really know how to reach the people. It could be for the greater good, as it was with Reagan, but it might not always be that way. And there's no necessity that technology or social transformations lead to perfection, despite our easy assumptions about progress. There's a reason the majority is now with Trump, or at any rate with Trump and Sanders, that is to say the candidates who are saying we're super angry at our elites. And that's why you see elite people like Elizabeth Warren all of a sudden being super anti-elite and talking about taxing the oligarchy, muzzling the oligarchy, somehow getting big money and big tech on a leash because the people are incredibly angry with them. That's American politics. Whenever change comes around, a guy wants to be president by saying, I will be the friend of the people against all these corrupt people in Washington. It's very attractive because there really are a lot of corrupt people in Washington and even more so people too incompetent because of their class assumptions to even understand what the people want or how to talk to the people. And technology isn't there, as powerful people believe, to amplify their message, to make them believable. It can do all sorts of different things. And so the liberals and progressives who thought that Silicon Valley was going to make them super popular, they would be able to brainwash America with progress turned around to hating all of Silicon Valley because it made Trump possible. The people who believed in TV as the way to elevate America or at least keep Americans fantasizing the same liberal ideas from the mid-century turned around to hate the fact that Trump used TV better than they all together could achieve. That shows you these are really times of change and it's useful to turn back to far more serious and less partisan or ephemeral statements and that's what Citizen Kane has to offer. It is the reflection not just of American society in the 20th century and the transformations in technology and politics. It's also the reflection of a guy who grew up with more serious thought from theater and who loved enough the theater of the old European aristocracy in order to reflect on permanent questions and problems of character. For all of American progress, you still need a president, you still need powerful people, still somebody arises who's a billionaire and then their character will matter. And so you will need to know how to judge character. As Orson Welles shows in the script, the problem with the American media is that they're no good at it. And the problem with much of American public discourse or authoritative speeches or even entertainment is that they suck when it comes to analyzing character and the relationship between men of great ambition and the people in a democracy. And so you have to turn to more serious studies like tragedy. You'd have to know your Shakespeare far more than what they say in a journalism school or learning to code. Very true. And that the final insight of it is that usually there's a, about a 10 year or so delay in between when a media technology takes off and makes its presence known and when a politician comes along who knows what to do with it. Radio was commonplace for maybe about 10 years, widely accessible thing before Roosevelt took office. And same thing with movies and what became talking pictures. But he was the first president who really knew how to use radio and use the movies and newsreels and such to his own benefit. Television came out in the late 40s and very early 50s under Truman and Eisenhower. But Kay was the first president who really knew how to use television. 
the very beginnings of reality TV and tab, you know, hard copy, inside edition, access Hollywood, or even things like, you know, Entertainment Tonight, PM Magazine, and such back in the day. And all of the news magazines, which morphed into Fox News and MSNBC on cable and into reality shows, those things were creatures of the late 80s and early 90s. But Clinton was the first president who really knew how to buy into that O.J. John Bonet tabloid culture and go full throttle with it. And the internet started in the 90s, but Obama was really the first president who knew how to use Facebook and Twitter in order to get elected. And Trump, of course, is the Twitter president. He is an absolute creature as a political entity of social media and of reality TV and 24-hour cable. The technology is always first. And there's always a lag and a delay before the political world knows how to catch up to it. That was sort of the final uh, message Cain left to us. His sled didn't survive, but his message lived on. Yeah, I think that we're ready to wrap our conversation here. This two-parter on Citizen Kane, what movie deserves it more, I hope shows there's a lot of thinking about America about society and politics, about technology and business, about popular passions and about the passions of the ambitious few at the same time that people can learn from. This is the only thing that makes the movies really worthwhile. The movies look differently under different technological and political conditions, but what they recur to always is trying to figure out what politics means in the fundamental sense of judging character. As The Federalist puts it, politics is the deepest reflection on human nature and it's not about the polls or about just one election or this guy doing politicking in his elected or appointed office. It's about our human nature, what we want out of life, what we can get out of life, where it is that we go crazy because of our desires to overcome human nature, and where it is that we might become powerful if we can unite in anger at injustice. These are the things that count, these are the things that make men great and make nations great, and that are therefore worth studying. Citizen Kane is a study of a character and of a society, and it fits the right character for the right society. This is what makes Orson Welles immortal in as much as art can, although he, like everybody else, had to be satisfied with a long life and then die. But something is left of him and therefore something is left for us to learn. And we've tried to show that in our own times we face the same crisis of media and politics, the same crisis of different classes of oligarchs fighting over who gets to represent the people, And of course, the same problems with the people who realize that they've bought into things that haven't been so successful and need some kind of change that they cannot provide themselves. We are recreating the drama, but it is still the same drama of human nature. And the better we understand that, the less we are swept by unpredictable events. So thanks for joining me, Telly. It has been a wonderful conversation, and I'm looking forward to talking about our times by doing a podcast on your book, Culture Wars in the 90s. It is my pleasure, and you can check that out, Culture War, Telly Davidson on Amazon.com, speaking of the media, and uh, look for me at, uh, well, just Google me, and you'll see some of my uh, work for various and sundry venues, and it's a pleasure and an honor to be on your podcast and to be associated with your organization. It's always good to get more talent on our critics series and we're hoping to show that the movies are about society and therefore people who can speak to what the movies have to say, what our artists reveal beyond entertainment and through entertainment, that's what counts and it's always a pleasure to have a new voice on the podcast to give us some degree of expertise. Well, it was a pleasure for me too. All the best, Ellie. Until next time. Thank you.